um good evening professor music kali hello hello good evening i'm i'm not in your formal style <laughs> uh nice to see everybody hello Hello, It's Eugene. about bedtime for us. Yes. Yeah. Marco, <laughs> good morning. Good morning, everyone. I think most of the panelists are joined, so in a mini talk, we'll start. Yes, right. Good morning, Mr. And good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Professor David. David D. Good morning. Good morning. Good to Thank be with all, all of you, especially that guy, Jerry Posner there. <laughs> And <that>? Dr. Foley. <laughs> Hi, David. How are you? Nice to, nice to know you're on the line, right? Well, you know, I'm in Italy, so I've got nothing else to do. I bet. <laughs> Wish I was there. It's uh, it's not a bad place well, to be. It's so we can start the session now. Yeah. Dear friends, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, bonjour, good night. Topical and geographical neurology specialty group of World Federation of Neurology. and indian academy of neurology have come together to organize this important series inspiring people in neuroscience and today we have the 11th session and i welcome you all for this session inspirational person today is professor jiro posner popularly known as j now if you are a student of medicine or a neurology all of us no professor postner to his marvelous book diagnosis on super and coma and he was a mentor to many in the field of neuro oncology his legacy is carried on at memorial sloan kettering cancer center new york the session about this inspirational person is going to be very special today because professor postner is with us in the room and professor lisa de angel is the most illustrious student of professor postner will take us to the life and work of professor postner and the highlight of the session will be conversation with professor postner warm welcome to professor jerome postner and uh, professor lisa de angel to share this important session we have wfn president professor vulcan jason Professor Grisold uh, is. Uh, we don't have to say much about him uh, when we say he's a president of president of the WFM. He is an Australian neurologist. Uh, he served as former secretary of WFM for seven years, and he has got a special interest in neuromuscular disease, neuro oncology, palliative care, advocacy, education, and history of neurology. and he has published several books book chapters and more than 250 publications professor gisold has uh, inaugurated this series last year and uh, he takes active interest in this activity 
and uh, in fact he was instrumental in connecting me with uh, Professor Lisa. Welcome, Professor uh, Lisol, uh, today's uh, chair. And uh, we also have a uh, distinguished uh, panelist and contributor for today's session, Adrian uh, Boyer, uh, Professor Gregory uh, Kankos, Robert Dornell, uh, Professor Jean. Uh, Yes, uh, Bellatre, uh, Professor Joseph Dalmau, uh, Catherine Foley, uh, Professor Ingo Melingroff, Professor Richard Price, Professor Nicholas Schiff, and Professor Bruno Geometro. I would also like to welcome distinguished personalities uh, who are with us in the room. Uh, WFN Secretary, Professor Steve Lewis, PGNS. Uh, uh, the Secretary, uh, Professor uh, Marco Medina, and uh, uh, Professor Tisa Vijayarapne, who is Chair of uh, World Brain Day, and uh, Professor Yuji Kazi, uh, former Vice President of uh, WFN, uh, Professor Raj Shakir, former President of WFN. And uh, we are very fortunate to have Professor David G uh, today uh, because the next session on 4th June is about Professor David G. Uh, more <laughs> welcome to you also, Professor David. And uh, uh, other dignitaries in the room, I would like to extend my warm welcome. And this series is doing going on extremely well, and there is so much of positive feedback about this, this series from the participants, because uh, we learn about the region, uh, we have done great work in the field of neurosciences, and uh, so that the, the younger generation gets the stimulation to do outstanding work in the field of their choice. And uh, I'm very sure that you will enjoy today's session because it is going to be the brain-to-brain -brain talk and mind-to-mind -mind talk and heart-to-heart -heart talk. And uh, before I hand over to Professor uh, Wilson Gifford, I would like to maintain, uh, remind you about the upcoming session I have said on 4th June about David G. And a very interesting session, historical session about uh, this walk on 2nd July. Thank you very much. Over to uh, Dr. Gesal and warm welcome to everyone once again. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Meshram. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, my name is Dr. Wolfgang Griesold. I've been introduced. I'm the current president of the World Federation of Neurology. And in that position, I'm happy that uh, the specialty group uh, of tropical neurology is able to do this excellent series. And in particular, I'm happy that we have this series today, this meeting today with neuro-oncology. And I, in particular, want to thank Meshram for his continuous effort to do that. Today, we have the honor and hear and communicate with one of the most eminent contemporary neurologists, Professor Posner. In addition to my personal engagement in neuro-oncology, I'm one of the many persons who have been severely influenced with, from him and from his work, although not being able to work with him personally. So this is one of the uh, abilities that he brought about this uh, knowledge on many things. And I have two things in particular I want to mention. His book on coma that I took on every holiday trip with me to study it and not to forget details. And in the further, uh, in the further development of course, cancer and paraneoplastic syndromes, and we'll hear about that. We have a large faculty and uh, well, we will hear contributions from many persons who have worked with Dr. Posner. But uh, I will ask now Lisa to say, to, to say a few words about him. But before that, I would like to introduce Lisa, uh, who doesn't need an introduction, but I'll do that. She is the physician in chief and chief medical officer, uh, Scott M. and Lisa of the Sloan Memorial Sloan Kettering Center in New York City. 
She oversees all clinical services, research, medical education, and multi-centered collaborations for MSK, including the 500-bed Memorial Hospital, 13 outpatient facilities in New York, and seven regional care sites across New York and New Jersey. Dr. DeAngelis is an internationally recognized expert in brain cancer and the neurological complications of cancer treatment, including cognitive impairment and stroke. During her 30-year tenure at MSK, she served as a chair of the Department of Neurology from 1997 to 2018 and confounded MSK's Brain Tumor Center, where experts from across MSK work to bring new discoveries from the lab to patients as quickly as possible. Um, Dr. Angeli's own research has focused on primary brain tumors, and she has led several clinical trials that investigate new tumor therapies. She has also helped develop the current regimen to treat primary CNS lymphoma. She is the author of more than 300 peer-reviewed manuscripts and 130 book chapters, and has written or edited eight books. Dr. DeAngelis is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. She's a fellow of the American Neurological Association and former vice chair of the board. She is also a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology, which in 2019 awarded her the organization's highest honor, the Wartenberg Lecture. With that introduction, I ask Lisa to introduce uh, Professor Posner to this session. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks to Drs. Meshram and Grissel for helping to organize this, uh, this really wonderful seminar. I like to define myself as a lifelong student of Dr. Posner, from whom I really, um, really learned to be a neurologist and neuro-oncologist. So let me, um, I have a few slides. Let me share my screen. Okay, hang on, we're getting there. So just to give a little bit of background and history, um, this is not the, so first of all, his early years, born in 1932 in Cincinnati, and Jerry just celebrated his 90th birthday. So happy birthday, Jerry. And uh, educated and trained in the Pacific Northwest at the University of Washington, where he fell under the spell of Dr. Fred Plum, who was then the new dynamic chair of neurology at the University of Washington. And in fact, the inaugural chair, the, the um, Neurology had just been established as a department when Fred uh, moved to Seattle. And after training there, Jerry joined the faculty uh, with Fred. And when Fred had the opportunity to come to New York City, and I should say come back to New York City, to become the chair of neurology at Cornell University and New York Hospital, Jerry came with him in 1963. And although they had made many of their observations about that became the core of the book, Stupor and Coma, the book was predominantly written while they were in New York. And its first edition was published in 1966. And of course, we all know that the title of the book is called Stupor and Coma, but most of us refer to it as Plum and Posner. Uh, this was really a transformative body of work and for young neurologists, it may seem very difficult to imagine that you would ever examine a patient in coma without the assistance of a CT scan, an MRI, a CTA, et cetera. Um, this was really all based on the clinical observations and how one could dissect the etiologies of stupor and coma based on the clinical exam. It is a stunning piece of work. But in 1967, everything changed for Jerry. 
at the time Memorial Hospital, which is directly across the street from New York Hospital, um, was part of the Department uh, of Neurology that the uh, faculty there had to have appointments at Cornell. And they had been in search of a full-time neurologist uh, to serve Memorial Hospital. At the time, it had been served predominantly by private neurologists doing the occasional necessary uh, consultation. And because there were no willing volunteers, uh, Fred sent Jerry to Memorial Sloan Kettering to lead the, what was then the neuropsychiatry service in the Department of Medicine. He started initially as a half-time or part-time uh, attending, although worked full-time, I'm sure, and in 1968 became the first full-time neurologist at a cancer institution. He was told by many um, illustrious neurologists at the time that he was throwing his career away. But, um, but Jerry made his career um, out of the continuing his really wonderful clinical observations while at Memorial. Prior to Jerry uh, taking control of neurology there, the Cornell residents did rotate at Memorial Sloan Kettering and they were so, it was such a, a period of relative freedom that they actually took their rotation, their vacations during their MSK rotations. But once Jerry arrived and started to realize how neurologically ill many of these patients were, the residents rapidly became very busy. And he also established how to care for patients with primary brain tumor patients, primary brain tumors. I particularly like this picture of Jerry because it has the coffee pot behind him. Um, and for those of us who um, had the privilege of working closely by his side for a long time, we know that coffee um, and diet soda was the sustenance that got him through his uh, very long days. Jerry's first objective was he could not do this by himself. So he needed to recruit talent. And the first person he recruited was Bill Shapiro, who was a former Cornell resident, but had gone to the NIH for a few years. At, but he brought Bill back to join him uh, at MSK, where they started by building models of CNS metastases in the lab they, and labs they had there. Bill went on to really develop the primary brain tumor program at MSK and led the national clinical trials uh, on malignant gliomas for many years. Bill became the second chair of neurology at MSK for a few years before he took, uh, took on the chair at the Barrows Neurological Institute in Arizona. He, Jerry also established the first pain service. And here's an early photo of Dr. Kathleen Foley, who we'll hear from in a little bit. And always thinking about the scientific underpinnings of the clinical observations he observed, he hired Dr. Gavril Pasternak a number of years later to establish a laboratory program that was focused on opioid receptors. He also, um, this was the neuropsychiatry uh, uh, service initially in medicine, um, but in 1975, neurology became a department at MSK, uh, which included psychiatry. And Jerry developed um, and really grew the first psychiatry service in a cancer hospital, hiring Jimmy Holland seen here. And Jimmy went on to develop a thriving clinical uh, and research effort. Psychiatry was an integral partner with the pain service and psychiatry went on to become its own department at MSK uh, about 20 years uh, uh, later. Jerry was really visionary um, in so many ways. MSK uh, very first PET scanner was actually in the Department of Neurology. At the time, PET was really a highly specialized imaging program. And we had one of only six uh, PET scanners in the United States. This program was led by David Rottenberg, 
Um, and really he studied the metabolism of neurotoxicity and many of the other conditions that we saw in the patients at Sloan Kettering. In addition, he hired Dick Price, who studied viral diseases of the nervous system, which of course was really important in patients with cancer. And most importantly, as we started to see uh, patients coming into Sloan Kettering with the cancers associated with HIV, Dick went on to really perform and continues to perform seminal work in the role of HIV and the nervous system. He, uh, Jerry also went on to develop pediatric neurology in conjunction with the Department of Pediatrics. So here's an early picture of doctors Kathy Foley and Dick Price at some conference. Um, and really they, I mean, th these are the core faculty that Jerry brought there and really established the full breadth and the depth of the department and, and unraveled, I think, the neurologic treasures, if you will, that could help us understand disease, diseases in the brain and the nervous system um, in patients who suffer from cancer. Jerry's own personal scientific contributions are too numerous for me to elaborate, and so many of the speakers later uh, today will, in, in this program will go on uh, to do that. But clearly, um, it, for his work done at Sloan Kettering, perineoplastic syndromes were really the hallmark of his um, mid and later career. He really characterized the classical syndromes and identified the characteristic autoantibodies that we all test for today. He elucidated the difference between the intracellular and cell surface antigens and the kinds of syndromes that they cause. He went on to identify new syndromes and characterize new antibodies, and also identified the important role of T cells in causing neuronal destruction although clearly the antibodies are generated by the B cell population. Jerry's um, profound influence was really uh, the, the fact that he seemed to master it all. He was equally expert in the clinic, and this is an early picture of him on, on our inpatient floor uh, at Memorial Hospital or what it looked like back then. Um, and also in the lab, and you see him here at the microscope. He had amazing facility to relate the science to the patient and the patient to the science. And, and that I think is something that all of us who had the privilege of uh, working alongside him and training with him really um, uh, sought to incorporate in our own thinking and our own approach to patients and neurologic disease. There were so many trainees from the lab who went on to develop their own laboratory effort, who identified new, went on to identify new syndromes, um, who refined our understanding of the so-called traditional syndromes. Many of them demonstrated a role, some of, uh, some of these antibodies in non-cancer situations as well. And Currently, antibody-mediated neurologic disease is widely recognized as one of the most important areas for us to understand in the entire field of neurology, and this area just continues to grow. Um, Jerry traveled widely. You see him here with um, Dr. Cesc Graus from Barcelona and Jean-Yves Delatre from Paris, two former uh, trainees. Uh, and also, Jerry was incredibly supportive of faculty and trainees. And I particularly show here a picture of, a, uh, of Jerry with a young woman who um, he can recall when Fred received the very first applicant to the neurology residency, who was a woman. He called Jerry and said, you know, we have a woman who's applying. Um, what should we do? And Jerry was like, she's good. You should take her. Um, and, and he did support um, women throughout, uh, throughout their careers, as well as um, people from all backgrounds. Uh, he really was a strong advocate for helping to develop 
people from all walks of life uh, and for them to become skilled neurologists. Really, he has a long legacy of trainees, and this is um, enhanced in part by the integrated neurology residency that continues to this day. Cornell residents um, continue to spend substantial periods of time at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and the residents loved working with him. He had an enormous influence on the program as a whole and on the residents individually. Of course, he went on to develop the first fellowship um, training program in neuro-oncology, and there are trainees throughout the world. As I went through the list, there were at least 37 leaders in neuro-oncology programs um, around the globe who had trained with Jerry and at least 10 chairs of departments of neurology. And you can find his trainees throughout North America, South America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. This is, he was a formidable educator and you see him here in this old picture. I'm not sure, Jerry, if this is uh, the MGH amphitheater, um, although I personally remember sitting in amphitheaters like this as a medical student. Um, but you can see everyone leaning forward to hang on to his every word um, because that is really how uh, people interacted with him. But for those of us who had the privilege to be at the bedside, um, it was really um, a masterclass in the neurologic exam and neurologic uh, physiology. It was really um, amazing. He was also a, an institutional leader at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And um, because Jerry is very self-effacing, this is really less well recognized. He's seen here in a picture with then chair of the Department of Men uh, Medicine, John Mendelson, who's in the mid middle, and the then chair of the Department of Surgery, Murray Brennan. And Jerry was always viewed as a trusted advisor to the senior leadership of Memorial Sloan Kettering. Here he is, he established um, the neuro ICU at MSK, believe it or not that he's actually standing in the neuro ICU there. That is what it looked like um, decades ago. And for those of us who are at Memorial, those beloved vertical charts that were such a um, nightmare to write notes in. He was also a national leader, president of the American Neurological Association, seen here at one of the um, dinners that was held uh, at that time. And the personal side of Jerry, nobody worked harder than Jerry. He was in the office by 4 a.m. every day. Um, he was a voracious reader and learner. Um, he saw his hospitalized patients at least twice a day, and I'm talking about when he was not on service, and a meticulous writer and, educate, uh, and editor who taught many of us that the least number of words that gets your message across uh, is, is really always the best. He was an absolutely inspirational individual. Um, and while he worked incredibly hard, he recognized in his trainees and faculty that they needed time off to be with family uh, and for others, and he would encourage that always. He also loved to travel. Um, it may seem hard to believe uh, if you watch him uh, living on the coffee and the uh, um, diet soda, uh, diet of his work day, but he really loved, loves good food and wine. And I actually had the pleasure of going on several professional trips with him where I really got to saw a very relaxed um, Jerry Posner and I could not believe it, but he would love to be out late um, talking and uh, enjoying himself. And uh, I just have a few pictures with so many colleagues there were too many pictures to um, go through, but Jerry loved to loved to travel, and always with him was his beloved partner uh, Gerda. And this is a picture scene. Um, I don't know what trip this was on, but it certainly in Asia. And in two thousand and five, um, 
he permitted us to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Department of Neurology. And you see Jerry here with his wife, Gerda, um, to the far left is the then president of Memorial Sloan Kettering, Paul Marks, and to, um, and, and to the right of Jerry in the picture is Esther Rowland or Bud Rowland's wife. And behind Jerry, is, you can see his family, his, uh, a table with his children and, and family. Jerry's modesty did not allow us to have the celebration focus on him personally, um, which of course we did anyway, but we used the excuse of the 30th anniversary of the department to really celebrate his many, many accomplishments. And um, I close here with a picture of Fred uh, Plum and Jerry at that celebration. Um, really, they came full circle uh, together. And that's the end of the slides. Um, Jerry, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. So what did I get wrong? Tell, um, did I get this story pretty correct? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I like to say that you were the most distinguished person I ever recruited to Memorial, but that's a lie. But you recruited yourself and I'm forever grateful for that. Well, you're, you're very kind. Why, um, tell us a little bit about um, your time in, at the University of Washington with Fred and, and how you went about making the seminal observations that became the book, Stupor and Coma. Well, first of all, uh, uh, I started medical school, I guess, and I was in the fifth graduating class of the University of Washington at which time it was a run-of-the-mill uh, university and a run-of-the-mill medical school, not the elite institution uh, it is now. I don't think I could have ever gotten in uh, had it been the current uh, University of Washington. Uh, my first year, some, the first, summer of my first year, I worked at the Boeing company in order to make enough money to pay what was a nominal tuition. Uh, we paid $50 a quarter for undergraduate school and $100 a quarter for medical school. Uh, during the second year, I worked in a, a pharmacology laboratory. The third year, I wanted to work in the summertime with a clinician, but I procrastinated so long, there was only one clinician who had a position, and that was a guy who'd recently arrived from New York and was looked upon by us Seattleites as being rather brash and difficult to work with. That was Fred Plum. <laughs> That changed my life, of course. At the end of the uh, third year, he said to me, you should go into neurology. And although I had no uh, reason for thinking I should do that, he told me and I usually do what I'm told. So I went into neurology. That was not a very wise choice at that time because there was a consensus that you couldn't make a living uh, being a neurologist. And neurology was not well recognized as an important uh, sub, uh, specialty. Nonetheless, I took the residency and went, and went into the army at the end of uh, the residency and then came back from the army uh, and took a fellowship with Ed Krebs uh, at, at the biochemistry department. Krebs at that time was the only MD in the uh, department of pharmacology uh, and the chairman of the department, Hans Norroth, did not like physicians. He wanted PhDs. Nonetheless, Krebs went on to win the Nobel Prize and uh, I think is now recognized as one of the most important people in the field of kinases. Uh, at the end of the, of the fellowship, uh, Fred appointed me as a instructor. And in 1963, uh, when he was recruited to go to the, uh, Cornell, uh, he asked me to come. He, were, he arrived in July of 63, and I arrived the following September. Uh, Greg? No, no. Go ahead, Jerry. Okay. And uh, after three years there, one of Fred's tasks, because Memorial Hospital supported three residents, so that we had three residents a year, and one of them was supported by Memorial Hospital. So Fred tried very hard to recruit someone to take that position. He offered it to every academic neurologist in the entire United States, 
And finally, after three years, gave up and said, you go. And that's how I got the memorial. <laughs> you weren't very happy about it, were you? Uh, not really, because I didn't know, well, that I didn't know what, what to do. But there was a neurologist in, in Brussels, uh, uh, George Hildebrand, uh, who was running what I conceived to be a good service of neurology, and which was very much like what I envisioned neurology to be at Memorial. Uh, and I kept in touch with George uh, through the years. In any event, I believed that we should do clinical work with brain tumors. Uh, at the time, Memorial Hospital took patients with any cancer except brain tumors. Uh, brain tumor service I essentially set up when I got there. And I thought we should study the neurological complications of cancer and uh, as well as brain tumors. And we started that when we got there. The fortunate thing for me was I was able to recruit people, Lisa accepted, uh, from C Cornell residency program. These were people who wanted to be near Fred Plum, but not too near. And therefore, <laughs> therefore I was able to recruit them. That, and that included Kathy Foley, uh, Dave Rottenberg, uh, Dick Price, and the people, the people who followed. Actually, the first recruit, uh, other than Lisa, who came from outside the institution was Gavril Pasternak who did not train at Cornell. Well, that was later. I mean, you, you, yeah. were, you had a, a, a well-established uh, department by that time. Yeah, well, yeah, that's right. That's true. And so how, how is it that you managed to be, to, to, you had such a breadth of activities that were going on that you developed while you were at MSK, I mean, including, you know, the psychiatry, um, the, the pet program. I mean, you went in so many different directions, some of which may have seemed at least peripheral to kind of like the, the core issues at hand, at least on the surface of it. The, my predecessor uh, at uh, Memorial had been a distinguished uh, psychiatrist, uh, Arthur Sutherland, who actually retired and moved to Italy. So one of my tasks when I got there was to recruit a psychiatrist. And uh, that turned out to be fairly difficult because the then chairman of psychiatry at Cornell, with whom I tried to interact, had no interest in that. Finally, Bob Michaels came to take over the chair of psychiatry at Cornell, and he helped me recruit a psychiatrist. We were very fortunate that Jimmy Holland from Buffalo was moving to New York and I was able to recruit her to start the psychiatry service within the Department of Neurology. And eventually she established her own department. How did you get interested in perineoplastic syndromes? How did that come about? Uh, two fellows uh, at the time, uh, Cesc Grouse uh, and Kurt Jekyll uh, were fellows. And we had a couple of patients with perineoplastic syndromes, which were pretty rare admitted to the ward at that time, and they wanted to study them. Now, my laboratory wasn't set up to do that, uh, but Carlos Cardone, who was in the Department of Pathology, had a laboratory looking at autoantibodies. And uh, uh, at that time, we had several fellows and residents from Barcelona, known as the Barcelona Mafia. And uh, they uh, enlisted uh, Carlos to help them set up this the, uh, the par uh, program for looking at antibodies. And they discovered first anti-YO, uh, which was the first par uh, paraneoplastic cerebellar degeneration antibody, and then anti-HU. The letters are the first uh, two letters of the last name of the index patients. Uh, so those were done in the mid 80s. And then of course, these, the program exploded. And you went on to license that testing, did you not? Right. Yeah, yeah well, uh, the people at Sloan Kettering suggested that we might try to get patents on that. And mm -hmm. indeed, we did. Uh, and for a while, it was uh, fairly lucrative. Uh, but the Mayo Clinic took over after that. Uh, and uh, and now uh, I may get royalties of maybe 10 or $15 a year even now. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll have to go and celebrate on that, <laughs> Jerry. Jerry, what... What else would you like us to know about, you know, how you how you went about your career and um, built the program at MSK? 
Well, I think I was very fortunate. Uh, there was always support from the administration which uh, didn't always happen in Cornell across the street, uh, but the people who in the administration, both the clinical administration and the academic administration were always helpful and uh, helped support me uh, until grants came, became available. That's, that's part of what we try and continue to do today. Well, I know you do that. So, so uh, no, it's not so, not so easy, right? It's it's that's it's an important so it's, it's an important thing to help um, get programs off the ground. Well, one of the things was a grateful patient uh, gave me a million dollars, which I had to split with Paul Marks, by the way. So I got <laughs> half of it, and uh, and that helped support the programs for a while before grants came in. Right. It was easier to get grants in the in the in the early days. It's hard, much harder now. Yes, yes. All right, um, Wolfgang, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Thank you. May, may I just ask one Thank question you, to Professor? Of course. May I just one ask in that sequence, what made you so interested in the side effects of cancer therapies? Because this is something that you opened up for neurology and this was often disregarded that there could be such things. Because we saw the patients and yeah. we had a big, big consultation service. Uh, after I got there, uh, more and more people were asking us to look at patients who had neurologic disease and who also had cancer. It became, and the treatments became available. And uh, we saw the patients. And when you see the patients, you have to learn something about them. Uh, and if you can, do something about it. So uh, thank you. And I think this is very inspirative that, uh, let's say, bed, bedside and to the development of that. And I think... One of your work is not only paraneoplastic, but this great awareness of the side effects of cancer, which is so great and so helpful. Um, I think we continue now, if, if I may suggest, because we have a number of people who want to say something to Professor yes. Bosnan. I just want to start saying something, and I think most of the things have been said by Lisa, and it's difficult to add anything here, but one could say that uh, Professor Bosnan is considered worldwide as the father so to say, of modern neuro-oncology. Mm. Uh, and he referred to Europe, and I, of course I know Europe best. Uh, there have been many, many followers of Professor Bosner, many trainees, I see at least one here uh, who, who stayed with Professor Bosner on the screen now. And this has risen the idea of neuro-oncology to be incorporated into neurology. And from, from the perspective of the World Federation of Neurology, of course, we know that in many countries, Neuro-oncology does not even exist by, by the name. And uh, I think it's we have a specialty group who is trying to implement that with uh, Dr. Tracy. Uh, and um, this is an important thing that we have. You have also mentioned Hildebrand, Jersey Hildebrand, who was all over Europe in demonstrating the importance of brain tumors. He was in the European studies and had one program after the other. And I also would like to mention Charles Wecht, who stayed with you and from whom we learned a lot. Not only oncology, but he also had an excellent way to communicate. And at every meeting, when we met him, he taught us how to, to, to bring things along. I think uh, I just want to, as there are so many aspects to be discussed and so many notions, I just want to say two things. I already said one thing, then it was the appreciation of your book, Stupor and Coma. I had the 66 edition and I had it, as I said, in All Holidays with me. The second book I had in All Holidays were Peripheral Nurse by, Mar by Professor Mumandaler from Switzerland, which was also an eye-opening uh, book and one couldn't live without those two books. I met Professor Bosner, he will not remember, I suppose, but I met him in 1981 when I was touring a few new university hospitals in, in, in America, which was, I was enabled with my train, with my trainer, Professor Ehrlinger, and I visited Professor Posner and to talk to me. And then during the talk, I think a patient came in his office who had a meningeal carcinomatosis and a shunt. And Professor Posner demonstrated to me uh, how he instilled metotrexate into his patient. And this was an eye opener and I think many patients I treated afterwards profited from this short interaction that was maybe 10 minutes, but it gave wisdom and it gave uh, 
many, many ideas for my future career and for others who did that. Uh, the last point is, and this has been mentioned, we have a, a common interest in paralyoplastic syndromes and we have, let's say, constructive times uh, together. And I think it's an important development. And he was also in our, and Professor Jumeto will mention that at our European ACE meeting once, and once I had the pleasure to have him in Austria at the Austrian Neuroscience Winter Meeting, they tried to combine neurology, neuro-oncology, uh, uh, um, neuropathology, neuroimmunology, and this was really a highlight of that visit. With that, uh, I stopped my personal recordings, and I will start uh, according to the list that I received. And please, uh, uh, if I just may start with the list that Lisa has given me, then I would first ask Adrian Bois from Sloan Kettering to say a few words on Professor Bosner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Um, and thank you for inviting me. I think I'm by far the most junior, uh, <laughs> the most junior neuro oncologist here. Um, and I think that speaks to um, just the great length and depth of, of Dr. Posner's um, influence. So I um, first met Dr. Posner when um, I was a, a fellow um, at Sloan Kettering and uh, beginning in 2012. And um, so at first my interaction was very clinical. I had the privilege of um, examining many patients elbow to elbow with uh, Dr. Posner and um, serving as his fellow in clinic. And um, to this day, I'll encounter a patient which is you know, kind of a, a diagnostic conundrum, which happens more often than it ought to, but it does. Um, and I think about what would, what would Jerry do? And he would have first examine the patient. Um, and so just a thoughtful, careful exam often clarifies everything. Um, and similarly, the kind of thoughtful, methodical approach is, is was sort of foundational to my own uh, laboratory experience. So um, later on in my fellowship, I pivoted to doing a, a postdoctoral fellowship in a laboratory in Juan Massagay's laboratory here at Sloan. And I was sort of casting around for how I was going to make my own career. And we were working on mouse models of parenchymal brain metastasis. And I had just spent um, quite a lot of time on service caring for a patient uh, with really terrible um, aggressive leptomeningeal metastasis from breast cancer. And, and she very much inspired me to try and, and solve this problem. And I dutifully went back to the laboratory and I realized I was quite stuck. <laughs> and I wasn't certain how I was going to start this process. And I knew that if I wanted time with uh, Jerry, I needed to just pop in and see him in the morning. And so I did, I'm a morning person, but I'm not quite as much of a lurk as Jerry. I, I, I come into the office at seven and by then he's already <laughs> finished several cups of coffee. Um, so I popped in to see him. And as usual, he kind of gruffly said, well, you're not reading the literature <laughs> um, and uh, pointed me to a paper from uh, 35 years earlier from 1977, uh, which is actually the year of my birth. Um, and there he was, he had uh, in collaboration with Shapiro, Chernick, um, and Posner had all uh, made a, a mouse model, actually a, a rat model of meningeal carcinomatosis. And that really was the roadmap for my own work. Um, so you know, he hands me the, the paper and I thought, all right, well, off I go. And he just encouraged me to just do it. I had all these reservations about why this might not work, how things could go sideways. And he said, why don't you just go do this and we'll talk later. <laughs> and um, when I'm encouraging my own trainees, I think the same thing. I think you can always think of a hundred reasons why something might not work, but maybe we should just try first. Um, and so for that, I'm eternally grateful. He's provided me with not just uh, a roadmap to handling clinical difficulties, but also to encouraging uh, intellectual bravery in myself, but in, in my own trainees. And it's really an honor to carry on in some very small way, uh, his own work. When I actually received a, a, an award from the American Academy of Neurology that was sponsored uh, by the, the friends of Jerome Posner. And it was it's really been the most, um, the greatest honor of my career so far is to be receiving anything with Jerry's name on it. So thanks so much. Thank you, Adrienne. This was very nice and memorable. I move on alphabetically according to the list and I go to Dr. Cairngross. Greg, would you 
be so kind and say a few words. Of course. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, and good morning, Dr. Poser. So nice to see you uh, after a long time and looking so well. Holy smoke, you remember everything. So well, please correct me um, because I think my memory isn't as good as yours. I would like you to know that I was in my office. I'm in my office. Um, I was here at 5.45 uh, to think about this morning. And uh, when we're done, I'm gonna work on a paper, finishing touches, I'm pretty excited about it. Um, so this early morning effort um, is in your honor. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about 4 a.m., but I can't do 4 a.m. Um, for those of you who don't know me, most do, but for those of you who don't, I'm a neurologist researcher at the uh, University of Calgary. And it seems funny um, because I feel like I'm putting the finishing touches on a career in neuro-oncology and still talking to the individual who got me started. Um, yeah, so it's, um, uh, yeah, an emotional morning for me. Um, my career had its beginnings uh, when I was a first year resident in neurology at New York Hospital. I was one of those people. Um, I began my neurology training July 1st, 1976 on the inpatient service at Memorial Hospital. Bill Shapiro was the attending neurologist. Um, of course, I had no idea at that time that my career and its interests would follow his own in the area of primary brain tumor. Um, but I enjoyed that rotation. I enjoyed it so much that I really looked forward to coming back to Memorial um, each year during the training program. We spent about a third of the year at Memorial. And those were the moments that I felt most uh, comfortable, most, um, most at ease most able to learn. And uh, the mood on the other side of the street, I think it's been alluded to already, was often a bit different. I mean, it was a great experience too, but uh, just a little different. So I like Memorial. Um, also that summer, interesting, I was thinking about this, I worked with a medical student from Hopkins named Paul Zell. And uh, Paul uh, went on to be a radiation oncologist trained in Boston, practiced in Bangor, Maine. And he and I remain friends to this day. So it was a, a very meaningful time in my life. Somewhere, I think in about the second year of the training program, Dr. Posner took me aside and proposed a research project in brain metastasis First time I'd ever done anything like that. Um, that simple paper that, uh, I mean, by today's standards, I think probably simple paper, big chart review, that kind of thing, um, uh, was Dr. Posner, J. Ho Kim, uh, and myself, you know, has been cited every year since it was first published in 1980. Hard to believe. Um, but, uh, in hindsight, of course, it was a great way for Dr. Posner to engage a young trainee in a new field. Um, he set the hook early. It was also an exciting time to be a beginner in this field um, because I bore witness to a number of interesting things. First. The, um, the first cohort of faculty members at Memorial Hospital I had a chance to uh, meet them, know them, work with them, learn from them. Um, Dr. Foley's on the call, Dick Price is on the call. Um, but I mentioned uh, Bill Shapiro, Dave Rottenberg's been mentioned. I'd like to recall Dean Young and uh, Matt Garvel subsequently and uh, Jeff Allen and others. Great, great people. 
uh, decent people, hardworking people, talented people, and, uh, and uh, all recruited by Dr. Posner, I think attracted to, uh, to the uh, department he was building. Uh, a special group of people in my mind. I also bore witness to the first cohort of neuro-oncology fellows, largely spectacular, but not all of them, I think, Dr. Posner. Um, uh, almost all of them were spectacular. I had my favorites, uh, Cliff Schold, I like to remember Cliff, uh, John Levin, good a character, Bill Wasserstrom, another character. And uh, I hung out with those people we shared interests other than neuro-oncology in sports and other things. So again, it was, uh, it was a terrific time. Uh, yeah, and of course that program, that neuro-oncology neuro fellowship program, which is now 40 years and counting, I suspect, um, has produced some, I think, remarkable people doing very interesting things. And many of them are, are current leaders in the field. As you, as you know. May I just say that we have about, could you kind of try to wrap bring up. your, yeah, yes. wrap up because we have about four minutes for each person in regard sure. to the large number of people. Sorry, sorry to be so yeah. impolite, but I have to conduct it. <laughs> Last work with Dr. Posner in June of 1982. I don't remember most things that he taught me. But I do remember how I felt when I was working with him. I felt engaged, appreciated, supported, valued, and inspired to go on to try and make a contribution to the field. In closing, I would just say that uh, I think Dr. Posner's ability to engage and inspire young people was his singular gift and will be, at the end of the day, his most enduring contribution. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. And uh, thank you for giving this overview over this complex structure of people who work in this institution. I will go over to Dr. Daniel now, next on the list. And Bob, if you would say a few words. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try and share a screen because I have some slides and pictures. So let's see if that works. Okay, I hope you can see that. Is that uh, any, any feedback? Are you guys able to yeah. see this slide? Yeah, start okay. advancing. We can see it. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, I, I just want to say up front um, something uh, as a. Can you hear, Jerry? Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah. Let me go ahead, do it. I'm on. I'm on. Running now or later? Maybe I'll go by later. Later would be better. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, you guys. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, so I, I just want to say up front that uh, without a doubt, Jerry uh, was the most important influence on my career, and I think maybe that's true for multiple people uh, uh, on this symposium. Um, and that's true with respect to uh, the science I, I've done with him, clinical science, but also uh, for me specifically, um, a, a very personal way as well, Jerry, the most important friend I've had uh, over the course of my career. I, and I think and I hope Jerry knows that. Um, uh, so I, in fact, would underscore that by saying how I've stayed involved in neuro-oncology uh, I moved across the street after finishing my residency uh, to Rockefeller University in uh, 1992. Um, and I continued as a neurology attending on service and on the consult service and the inpatient service um, ever since then up until just before the pandemic um, and refused to take any salary from Lisa, although she was extremely generous in offering it. But my... Uh, I stuck to my uh, instinct that what I wanted to do was to come and learn from Jerry, how to be a good clinician scientist. And um, so that motivated me to try and come in early every day, as we've talked about 
Um, and I did okay, but I could never beat Jerry. <laughs> I could come in at five o'clock and he was always at work as Fred Plum would describe him, um, as a Talmudic scholar who picked up the wrong book. That he picked up the book of neurology and would study for three hours plus every morning until seven o'clock came around with respect to comments made earlier at which point his day was effectively over because everybody would ask him questions all day subsequently. So I, I'm just gonna uh, fast forward to my own interactions with Jerry and how they started. Uh, I was a neurology resident um, because of really Jerry Posner. I didn't fully recognize it at the time. I, I had done an MD PhD uh, and became interested in the fusion science uh, of brain disease and cancer. And I only applied to one place, which was Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, where I was vaguely aware, not as aware as I uh, should have been probably, that that was the only place to go to. Um, and when I was there, uh, I stayed up all night reading literature um, several times uh, when Jerry would come in in the morning and then discuss the recent literature with him critically. And that was I think really fun for both of us. And there I became aware of the work um, that he, Jerry referred to himself by Jay Golo Grouse and uh, uh, Carlos Cardone. But I would, I, which are just sort of illustrated here in, in a general sense, but I would underscore Jerry's modesty in uh, the way he presented his interest uh, in perineoplastic disease. Um, and that was, it, it went from the bedside into the clinic, uh, into the uh, laboratory, as he said, but it was really Jerry who came up with the idea and the hypothesis that the latent cancer and the overt rapidly, uh, rapid onset neurologic disease could be immunologically connected. It was not known at the time. So he pushed his uh, fellows and colleagues to test that hypothesis in exactly the way that was referred to again um, earlier. Um, so uh, that is what underlay these papers. And that's what in fact became groundbreaking, groundbreaking work. And uh, my interaction with Jerry took that one step further. Um, and it was from, again, a patient that we saw uh, on the wards uh, with the initials NB, Isabel, probably breaking HIPAA violations here. Um, but this patient, NB, uh, had a very high titer antibody in her spinal fluid compared to normal, as, as seen on this slide. Um, and this was 1988, beginning of 1988. Um, and uh, this was an a, a, a autoradiogram from Jerry's lab. And I had learned enough molecular biology um, around that time to think about trying to use high titer antiserum like this for not only for Western blocks, but to do expression of cDNA cloning. Um, and this is uh, one of the uh, evidences of how generous Jerry was to me. Um, he allowed me to come in to his laboratory during my clinical neurology years uh, at night. Um, so I, again, modeled myself after him and worked as many hours as my brain could tolerate. And uh, here I took this patient's um, Sarah with uh, insight and backing from Terry and was able to identify a clone. And so this established the method for doing expression CD cloning. Um, I, I noticed here a comment. I stored this at four degrees for vacation, which is something Jerry would not have uh, known, I think. But, um, you know, I, I, I just want to. Uh, <laughs> sort of fast forward on where this work led to in terms of my uh, appreciation for Jerry here. Um, and I know the time is short, so I'll just go through a few points. That clone uh, and that antiserum patient NB led to our first papers together, um, which uh, identified a uh, perineoplastic cerebellar degeneration unique antigen, uh, both by uh, molecular characterization and cloning ultimately what it was it turned out to be a neuron-specific vesicle code protein. Um, 
May yeah, I just say uh, that we are getting out of time a little bit? Could you also yeah, wrap up? No, I, Sorry. I, I, I got it. I'll, I'll keep going just for a bit because I, I, you know, I have to go yes. um, So we went on to clone other perineoplastic antigens. This is uh, the RI antigen. Uh, and we went on to use those clones to establish the basis of tumor immunity, uh, being as Elisa alluded to, both the B cell and the T cell phenomena. Um, and of course, I went on to uh, write a book that I'm not deserving on, really, Joseph Delman and others on, uh, Jean Yves and others on this uh, line are more appropriate uh, uh, to comment on. So I know uh, the time is short, Wolfgang, but I'm just going to take a few moments anyway until you cut my uh, voice off. I, I just, some discussions I've had with Jerry. Um, I, I wrote some uh, really interesting comments down over the years. So uh, with respect to science, Jerry uh, had this anecdote that I love. Um, was it Ted Boyce working on uh, uh, immunology and HLA haplotypes uh, was all excited about it until um, Jerry informed him that Oost Thomas had predicted the phenomenon he was working on 20 years earlier by recognizing that bloodhounds could not identify identical twins, the kind of insight Jerry would have in science uh, and, and make the connections referred to earlier. Uh, he told us a story about uh, Corey's wife who worked with him uh, on the Nobel Prize purifying phosphorylase and how extremely uh, detail-oriented she was that she made unexpected discoveries, which I found inspired. Uh, and, and this is uh, professor's rounds that Jerry and Lisa would do um, every morning uh, that I'd love to come to. Uh, and uh, one of the things he was grilling a uh, resident on who had diagnosed uh, uh, diffuse medial enhancement with colon cancer and uh, pointed out to them um, that, that this could have been made as a clinical diagnosis before a lumbar puncture uh, by asking them what testing you not do, and that was the first olfactory nerve, um, the sort of uh, example of the kind of pearls Jerry had. Um, so uh, regarding uh, personal wisdom, and this is my last slide, Wolfgang, hang in there. Um, <laughs> the, the sort of things Jerry would uh, muse with me about early in the morning, uh, this is a quote from him, getting old, uh, with respect to getting old, everything works, but nothing works quite as well as it used to. <laughs> A comment I enjoy in this context. Uh, another one: exercise doesn't make you live longer. Live longer. It just seems that way. Uh, <laughs> these are direct quotes from Jerry. Uh, and uh, following accolades for him at one of the uh, re retirement things at Memorial, um, Jerry uh, got up and spoke and said, "I asked my wife, Jerry, what what to say, and she said, say thank you and sit down.' So Jerry said thank you and he sat down." So with that, I will close my comments Thank and just fi finally say, uh, Jerry was not only an inspiration to me scientifically and personally, but in his actions and uh, exemplified it in no better way, perhaps, than the way he cared for Fred Plum all the way uh, till, till Fred Plum died. So, Thank you. Sorry, I went Thank over seven minutes and 54 seconds. No, no, it's more, it's more than that, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> so that's fine. <laughs> let's, let's continue. Let's continue and try to stay with four or five minutes because otherwise we cannot get the whole faculty through. I would like to ask now Jean-Yves Delatre. Uh, we jump to Europe and maybe Jean-Yves, you would like to comment on your time and yes. your relation to <clears throat> Professor Bosner. Yes, uh, do you hear me, uh, welcome? Yes, yes, sure, perfect, thank you. Uh, so, you know, I was in Paris as a resident in the early 80s and there was a lot of papers coming on which uh, were basically deciphering the neurology of cancer. And uh, in this paper, there were always two names. One was Jérôme Posner, and the other was Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I was extremely interested, and I decided to go to the American Academy of Neurology and to wait for Dr. Posner uh, after uh, one of his conference. And uh, after this conference, I didn't have to talk. Dr. Posner looked at me and said, do you want to come as a fellow? I didn't talk yet. 
And I said, yes, a lot. And this was done. And I came to New York. And when we think uh, to a mentor of a mentor, as Dr. Postner was and still is, it is interesting to see in which way he deeply influenced our whole professional life. I will not insist on his huge medical contribution, which has been well described by Lisa and by other colleagues here. I will rather insist on behavior. Uh, and two words come to my mind, humility and openness to others. Uh, the modesty of Dr. Posner is legendary. Power is clearly not his problem. But improved knowledge, yes. In addition, I was struck that he always took great care uh, to valorize his young colleagues. And because of this humility, I'm not even sure that he is very happy with what we are doing today to honor him. <laughs> the, the second point is the openness and interest to others, which is, I think, another key feature of uh, Dr. Posner. And uh, this is true on a professional point of view. And I remember several discussions that we had uh, well, in which Dr. Posner clearly did not agree with my proposals. However, at the end of the discussion, he always concluded, if you believe it, do it. And this was a great lesson that I did not forget. But this openness to other is also true on a personal and a human point of view. And I remember Thanksgiving in New York, during which I met Jerry's children and Gary, with whom he was so attentionate. Uh, finally, Dr. Posner taught me how to sleep during conferences. <laughs> as, <laughs> as you know, conference room are rather dark. And I suspect that Jerry go very rapidly to a paradoxical sleep, but wake up as fast, producing a repeated movement of the neck that we interpret as strong approval of what we are saying. And I had this experience during one of my first very, very boring talk, I admit. And when I saw in the dark Jerry approving, I was so happy. <laughs> but when the light went on, I just realized that he was just sleeping a lot. <laughs> so thanks a lot, Jerry. Inspire my life, and I'm very happy to see you. Guy, thank you for, the, for your nice words and for also for the beautiful timekeeping. Thank you. I will now move on to Kathleen, Kathleen Foley, who has been mentioned so often. Kathleen, may I give the word to you? Sure. Um, hi, Jerry, and thank everyone for organizing this. Um, I uh, spent 40, about 42 years at Memorial, either working for Jerry or with Jerry. And um, today's you know, so impressive to hear from everyone and so good to see everyone and particularly to see you, Jerry. Um, I, I wanted to focus um, and stay to the time um, really on his contributions to the field of cancer pain and, and palliative care because um, really he made pain uh, in cancer patients uh, one of the uh, neuro-oncologic uh, issues. And so he was primary brain tumors, it was metastatic complications of cancer and it was pain. And um, in the pain area, he recruited me from, um, after I finished my training at Cornell, he convinced me to come across the street to Memorial. This is in the mid 1970s. And it was believed by the people at New York Cornell that you were giving up your career and to go across the street to a cancer center. 
And many people said, why would you ever want to work in a cancer center with all those dying patients? And so uh, Jerry convinced me that it was a good thing to do. And I came because of Jerry. Um, I told him that I knew nothing about pain. And he said, well, don't worry, no one else does. And, um, and that was the beginning of uh, the development of a whole clinical program in pain. He immediately introduced me to Dr. Ray Hood, who was then an international expert in clinical analgesic trials. And then over the next 30 years, the Department of Neurology housed the first pain clinic in a cancer center, the, the first pain service in, a, in a, a cancer center, and eventually a pain and palliative care service. So in, in advancing um, the need to improve the care of patients with pain uh, and the clinical components to that. And he was the impetus behind the early clinical research of um, the neurologic pain syndromes of uh, patients who had brachial plexopathies and how you would di diagnose them early, um, on lumbar sacral plexopathies and how you would distinguish brachial and lumbar sacral plexopathies from radiation-induced uh, plexopathies. Mm -hmm. And then the whole field of, of uh, we saw a series of patients, again, going back to the bedside, of patients who'd had Hodgkin's disease and 20 years later had plexopathies. And these were patients who developed radiation-induced malignant schwannomas. And so these papers, again, were so important to the, those who are caring for cancer patients because it gave them the tools to be able to assess these patients and I think most importantly, to diagnose them early and to prevent neurologic injury. He also um, taught us about uh, spinal cord compression and so a range of papers on pain in the patient with cancer and back pain and how we make these kinds of uh, diagnostic assessments with simple x-rays, if that's all you had, or with much more sophisticated MRI imaging. But um, along as, as uh, very much Lisa has said, he uh, supported the idea that we needed a very basic uh, research program. So he helped recruit Gab Pasternak. Gab came to Memorial, set up a really innovative program in opiate receptors. Gab identified splice variants of the morphine receptor. And although Gab has died, his work continues in a startup company called Sparian, which is currently working on uh, um, opiate receptor, new opioid analgesics uh, that do not suppress respiratory, that do, that do not suppress respirations. So the work continues, um, and in fact, continues by Gab's family members who are uh, leading that company. So he also um, supported us to be involved in national and international organizations. And so Memorial became, one, uh, became a, a WHO collaborating center for cancer pain and for uh, cancer pain research and education. And again, Jared was behind it and supportive and, um, and willing to give the resources that we needed and help find the resources to do that work. So in fact, none of this would have happened without his vision, without his support, um, because he really every day saw the impact of pain um, on this population of patients. And this was not easy in those days because the administration um, was not necessarily um, on our side in focusing on a non-cancer curative approach. Um, and he, he, like I had to do with hospital administrators and bean counters about funding concerns. But he was the supporter, he was the champion. So, um, so how did he do all of this? I think you've heard from many of the people today. He was the master educator, he was the mentor, he was the role model clinician. Um, he had great amazing characteristics of a leader. You've heard all of them. But the one he didn't have is that he, um, he was uh, very um, unwilling to celebrate successes. So that was a little bit difficult because we'd always want to celebrate these successes. And Lisa's identified the 30th anniversary, but that was not easy <laughs> to get Jerry to agree to it. When those of us who work with Jerry or train or reminisce, the things we talk about are his, um, his, his personal um, attributes and his personal outbursts in the mornings when he'd be slamming the doors because the uh, Xerox machine didn't work or the computer wasn't working. Um, he would know more about any patient you had admitted than you did on any day that they were in the hospital. Had he heard this before, he had this incredible dislike for bureaucracy and pomposity. Uh, but his compulsivity and his timeliness and being succinct was what he sort of drilled into us, not in any personal way, but simply by a, as a role model. So when we all come back to talking about Jerry, we see him as the most influential teacher, the smartest diagnostician, 
the, your most loyal supporter, um, and the one you turn to when you need help professionally or personally. So thank you, Jerry, for all you've done. It's wonderful to be with you today. Thank you very much, Mia. Just ask you to turn down the microphones because we have some feedback here in the in the loop. So if you if you don't talk, unmute yourself so that we don't have the feedback. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Foley, for this uh, for this words. I would jump to Europe now, and uh, if Pro Professor Jometo would be ready to say a few words about Professor Posner, then I would ask Bruno to continue here. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me this afternoon. And uh, just very, very few words. I had the honor to invite Professor Posner to Treviso in Italy in 2006 to contribute to the meeting Paraneoplastic Neurological Syndromes State of the Art. He presented an ex excellent historical review and a very careful up-to-date talk on PNS. He was a of this meeting like a mentor for the European PNS network. The team was funded by European Commission through a concerted action starting in 2002 and permitted the collection of a thousand cases of PNS across Europe. It was really a pleasure to have Professor Posner in Italy, Professor Posner in Treviso. And if I could share the screen now, I'll show you, uh, no, I'll try to share just a picture. Uh, no, anyway, don't worry. And also I was impressed by his unassuming demeanor during the ceremony where the mayor of the city presented him with the keys of the city. I had the picture for this, unfortunately, I can't share, share with you, I don't know if possible now, but try to share anyway. No, it's not possible for me. Okay, sorry, but I tried to, 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 to share this picture of Professor Posner with the mayor of the, key of, mayor of the city of Treviso where he received his keys. It really was an understatement that was wonderful. And I hope Professor Posner will remember that visit to Treviso in 2006. Thank you very much again for inviting me. Thank you, Bruno, and I will continue. Uh, Lisa, I, have, I took the liberty to insert people because we have more people who want to say something, but we save time now. And it's time now for Dr. Melinkhoff uh, to speak on Professor Thank Posner. Thank you again, Bruno, for this. Sorry, we couldn't see the slides. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for having me. Good morning, Jerry. It's so good to see you. And uh, it, it's really wonderful to see um, and listen to this. So I'm a neuro-oncologist and I happen to be uh, the current chair of the Department of Neurology at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And it's uh, enormous pleasure, honor, and responsibility to try and attempt and follow in uh, Jerry's footsteps, of course, as you can imagine. So I just want to add a few personal uh, comments here. I first met Jerry in 2007 uh, when I had just moved from uh, UCLA in Los Angeles to New York City with a wife, two young children, a lab manager, some students and postdocs, and trying to figure out how this place runs. And uh, Dr. DeAngelis, in her infinite wisdom was the chair of neurology at that time and said, you know, why don't you just practice right next to Jerry? So I was in clinic side by side with Jerry on Friday mornings. And um, it was uh, just really so wonderful. I have to admit that uh, unlike Dr. Grishold, I had not taken uh, the Plume and Posner book on vacations with me. And I also hadn't read all of Jerry's papers. So I was a little bit underprepared of course, which never bothered Jerry, who, uh, on the other hand, seemed to have read some of my papers and felt that my studies on kinase signaling were really very important and the future of neuro-oncology. And I have to admit, Jerry, I don't know if that's really what you were thinking, but you made me think that you were thinking that, and I felt really very special and secure and welcome, thanks to your very inspiring and generous uh, work as a colleague, really, on the face, all the things that you have just heard from other folks as well. So thank you for that. 
Jerry also very graciously often pulled me into a patient room and told the patient that Dr. Mellinghoff is going to be their doctor going forward. And not all patients seemed immediately thrilled by that idea. But, you know, Jerry's, um, Jerry's endorsement, of course, carried a lot of weight. And um, they, uh, they welcomed me as their doctor. And I, I always reassured them that Jerry was just down the hall anyways, in case uh, things went down the wrong way. And Jerry, you've been a, such an inspiring um, colleague. And of course, these Friday morning sessions came with regular micro doses of Jerry wisdom and uh, Jerry uh, humor and have really been um, amongst my most rewarding professional experiences, I would say, in my career so far. Um, so those are really wonderful personal experiences. I really came to appreciate Jerry's footprint um, on the field of neurology when I gave seminars at other institutions over the years, because I always got the same two questions. Question one, what are you working on? And question two, what's Jerry doing? How is he? And everybody really wanted to know about question two, and, and hardly anyone really seemed to care that much about question one, which was absolutely fine with me. Um, but But really... Jerry, I think the footprint uh, you left on the field is uh, both very obvious and very deserved. I would say it's no understatement to say that many patients with cancer live a better life because of you. Uh, you brought neurology to oncology, and I think you've established a department that is really squarely focused on the relationship between cancer and the nervous system. And your modesty and your uh, humor has served as an antidote to some of the medical arrogance that we sometimes see in other environments. And you've encouraged us, I think, all of us, you heard this from Adrian as one of the younger members now in our department, that um, we all kind of roll up our sleeves, think of you, and want to acknowledge and embrace our gaps in knowledge. And um, while our department has grown, since uh, you started it uh, considerably. I think we have not uh, veered in our vision and mission of the department. And um, so on the behalf of the current faculty, um, many of, and staff of our department, many of whom of course know you and admire you, Jerry, and uh, you know as well, I would like to thank you for a lifetime of caring and scholarship that you have provided to us we will do our very best to live up to that example. And uh, we will try to rise to the challenges of our generation. And um, as Lisa said so aptly early on, relate the patient to the science and the science to the patient. And um, I think that Jerry is, is something we've learned from you. So thank you very much. And it's so good to see you. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Melinghoff. I think, uh, Lisa, we have three people more, Dr. Price, Dr. Schiff, and I also want to invite Dr. Dalmau to say a few words. So I will start with Dr. Price according to your list. And so Dr. Dalmau will be the last. So please go ahead, Dr. Schiff, and also try to, uh, Dr. Price and Dr. Price, sorry, correct myself, Dr. Price, and let's stay within four to five minutes that we can uh, manage the time. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, there's so much has been said that's uh, that's all true. And um, I, I, as I was listening to this, I was just the question is how how can one person accomplish so much? I mean, what what are the what are the what are the qualities of Jerry that he could he could just do so much? And I I, I think the singular things are. Yeah, he's extraordinarily intel intelligence, but his capacity to his creative capacity to see things beyond what other people see, and to put things together and uh, he's in these various areas is just quite incredible. And 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 then the other thing is that comes out in all these conversations is how generous he's been, how much he's done for so many other people, patients. But all the people who talked today, he's just a tremendous generosity. Um, i just say a little bit about myself. I, I, the turn of my career really relates to a case report that, uh, that uh, I wrote with Jerry and Norm Chernick 
in my residency. And, um, that turned my career towards uh, an interest in, uh, in viruses and in, in, in immunology. And I think that's the same thing for so many people. So I, it just the, his impact is, uh, is extraordinary. Uh, we've heard the, the depths of it and we've heard the range of it, but um, it, it, it's, it's hard to think of one person who could do so much. And I, I just leave my words at that. And I'm so grateful myself. I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, he's been the biggest impact of my, on my career and so forth. And I would always like to emulate, but I, I, I couldn't. I, I don't have the capacity for what he's done. Thank you very much for your kind words. And I would now hand over to Dr. Schiff. Hi, um, I'm Nico Schiff. I'm a neurologist at Weill Cornell, and um, I train with Jerry. Uh, and since that time, we've sustained both a collegial relationship and a friendship. And I have a, I prepared just three slides, and I'll stay on time. Um, I've worked most closely with Jerry on the revisions of his epic book with Fred Plum, uh, originally titled The Diagnosis of Stupor and Coma. And um, I just want to share a couple of stories. I, I'll, I quickly show three slides. When I first started working with Fred on disorders of consciousness and reviving neuroimaging studies in the mid-1990s, uh, Jerry was very supportive, and we were getting a lot of resistance. And, and people pe people were basically telling me what they told him, which was you know, in his beginning of his career, is that this is kind of a waste of your time, and why are you going to do this? And I remember talking to Jerry, and he said, look, this reminds me very much of what happened with us in the late 1960s when we first started trying to treat leukemia. He said, people, people didn't do so well. And I remember being told, why don't you just let these people die with dignity? And he said to me, you know, if, had we listened, but they'd still be dying with dignity. And now we have leukemia as one of the most treatable cancers. And I remember that conversation very vividly. And it was a, it was inspirational because, and, to be fair, you know, along the way, we still get a lot of resistance, but it was one of the real touch points for me. But I really first came to understand uh, how Jerry worked uh, for real once we uh, started to work on the revision of Stupor and Coma. We, had, we revised the third edition, which at the time had come out in 1982. This was the fourth edition, and it, it was published in 2007. And Jerry basically edited line by line every single chapter that he didn't write himself line by line and i learned so much about neurology about editing and just in general uh in this process and uh it was a great it was a great day when uh he and fred plum and i uh and cliff saper all got to sign this cop this book uh for people at the aan in 2007 um but I think, you know, and I'm going to be brief, I, I, there's so much I could say, but I, I want to say that, you know, Jerry continued to think about this, even though this wasn't his main line of work, obviously, uh, following uh, the time that he walked across the street. And just after Stupor and Coma published the fourth edition, he got asked by uh, Steve Hauser to review a paper that he asked me to come in and work with him on the review. And it was a very interesting paper. It was one of the first cases of patients with uh, disorders of consciousness who had paradoxical responses to Ambien. And we got this image uh, from the paper, the paper's in the middle here from this French group. And Jerry and I were writing it up and I had been working on deep brain stimulation in this network model. And I noticed something in the, in the images, which we both thought was very interesting, which was if you looked at the placebo group, a placebo condition of this patient, the basal ganglia had this sort of, you know, very cold caudate head. But then when they turned on, you know, it, it filled in and the cortex filled in, there was a big effect. But the most interesting thing was that there was actually a suppression here in the pallidum. And that was something that, as we talked about it, we basically built um, an insight that came together in a model that uh, I developed uh, for disorders of consciousness. And then when we got to the fifth edition, and now there are two things about the editions I wanted to point out. In this, in the fourth edition and in the fifth edition, as Lisa said, it's now Plum and Posner. It was always Plum and Posner by uh, by casual commentary, but now it's officially Plum and Posner. But we've done Plum and Posner twice, and the last edition became Plum and Posner's diagnosis and treatment of stupor and coma. And Jerry continued to be very interested in this and building on these ideas from the Mesa circuit that were already present and they crystallized in this uh, short report he and I wrote. 
he and I spent uh, several years talking about the need to develop time trials of pharmacologic agents and to use more than one pharmacologic agent. And he made the point that neuro-oncology had long ago abandoned the use of single agents. And it was time for you guys to think about polypharmacy. And so we published the first algorithm into the fifth edition of Super and Coma. So there's a lot more I could say, but I think the most important thing I wanna say is, Jerry, thank you for your continuing mentorship and interest. I think it's clear that this is true for everybody um, and I'm very, very appreciative of it. Thank you. Thank you very much for this also very inspiring uh, continuation of work. Uh, before I give the word to Dr. Dalmau, uh, also Professor John Greenlee, widely known for the PCD, has also sent a video. I don't know whether it's here, but he sent a message that he was never working directly with Professor Bosner, but how much he appreciates him and he's not able to come today for family reasons or something. Otherwise, we would have liked to invite him too to this pen to this. Uh, panel of, uh, of the, to this panel. So thank you. And uh, Dalma, Dr. Dalma uh, is here. And I think he's, uh, in, at least in Europe, uh, continuing with the development of new syndromes every week. No, I'm exaggerating. But <laughs> Josep, uh, please yeah, say well, a few thank, words about her. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang and, and Lisa for inviting me to to, to say a few words and it, it's great to see you, Jerry. I'm very happy to be here. Um, um, I'm, I, I would say that uh, I'm very proud to be one of the latest members of that historical mafia group that you identified, that you described earlier and, and uh, that was great. Um, I, I, I was, I remember during a night that I was uh, on call in my second year of neurology residency in Barcelona, this is a long time ago. I started reading a stupor and coma, which I finished the next day. The book was an extraordinary learning experience and the concise and precise writing was new to me. Uh, later that uh, year, I was doing uh, neurology consultations in the oncology department and I became aware of the many of Dr. Posner's studies I read all the articles I could find, and I decided I wanted to train with him. For the fellowship uh, interview, I met Jerry during the 13th World Congress of Neurology in Hamburg. Uh, this was in 1985, and I was very happy that by the end of a very short conversation, uh, he accepted me. The initial plan was to go to Memorial for a clinical fellowship funded by a Spanish agency to karyotype brain tumors. Nothing worked as planned. A few months before my arrival, the ECFNG issued new rules that prevented foreign graduates from seeing patients unless they repeated their residency. In front of this unexpected problem, Jerry wrote me that the only way to come to Memorial was as a research fellow in the lab. Despite my total lack of uh, experience in the lab, I accepted and became fascinated by the neurological complications of cancer, mainly the paraneoplastic syndromes. I never karyotyped a glioma. And instead of two years, I spent 11 years at Memorial the last eight years been able to see patients. During these years, I became very aware of Jerry's extraordinary clinical skills and I was truly impressed by that. I, I remember that he addressed each consultation with such precision and to my wonder, in the first three to five minutes of the patient interview, he was able to formulate a set of questions that invariably led in the right direction most of the time. Therefore, on a personal level, the influence of Jerry started long before I met him and continues until now. When says Graus, who also was trained by Jerry, and I recently wrote the book on autoimmune encephalitis that was recently uh, published, 
the lessons we learned from Jerry were echoing in our minds. Beyond my personal views, Jerry's influence in the entire field of neuro-oncology has been monumental. Even if we only consider the field of paraneoplastic neurologic disorders, his many contributions describing the new syndromes, antibodies, pathogenesis have been enormous. Dear Jerry, uh, the Barcelona crew, Cesc, who is traveling, Cesc and Flora, who are traveling right now, Myrna and I, thank you very much for your work and your constant mentorship. Thank you. Thank you, Josep, for your nice words. Uh, Lisa and Professor Posner, would you like to say something after this? excellent different stories and different perspectives, in particular, Professor Posner. Yeah, uh, actually, I don't recognize myself in the things that have been said about me, but I, I am most grateful. I thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, would you like to say something? There are no questions except one one person who, who acknowledges this meeting and the content of the meeting from India. So that's not, not a question. But Lisa, may I hand over to you for a brief wrap up from your perspective? Thank you. There, will be Thank a you. Perfect talk. Uh, there are a few people in the room who would like to make some comments. Okay. Who, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's do that. Who is that? Who is that? I don't. I don't. Yeah, I'm not aware. Who is that? Uh, so Professor Yuki Khan, you are still there? Uh, from Professor Tisa. Tisa is here. Tisa is here. Uh, I'm basically speechless. It's getting close to 1 a.m. in the morning. I think, Professor Posner, your book is right next to me. And uh, the, this is inspiration at very best. Uh, I think you are the living example of uh, what a clinician scientist can do to this world. As best as I can, as the World Brain Day Chair, I'll, I'll, I'll spread this uh, word of inspiration as best as I can. I, I'll just say thank you. Thank you very much for you and everyone in the crew. And uh, thank you, Professor Meshram, for organizing this uh, unbelievable, amazing, inspiring to the core uh, story and i can stay throughout the night uh, this, this, as, as i said this is inspiration at very 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 best from all of you thank you we have okay, Tisa, uh, Ruji, yeah Ruji, i think Ruji wants to say something Ruji, may i invite you to say something oh yeah uh, i i think uh, i'm i'm quite much uh, impressed by those people and uh and uh, I, I can say to, to, uh, to you that uh, I, I do have a, a kind of a similar situation uh, uh, that all, everybody has, has right now uh, uh, already mentioned. Uh, one thing I, I, I like to say is uh, th th there has to be a growing field uh, like uh, uh, like neuro oncology in 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 that area uh, era, and uh, so I I think uh, there must be a kind of spirit of pioneer, uh, like Professor Posner, and uh, then that's what I learned from this uh, lecture series. Thank you. Thank you, Roji. Uh, Mesham, is there anyone else who wants to speak? You mentioned two. Is uh, where these two people? Sir, uh, Professor, uh, uh, we have Professor David G also and uh, Asif Sheikh. Uh, uh, okay. Have, yeah, Professor David G. Being the last letter in the alphabet, I'm, I'm very happy to give a one minute to Jerry Posner. Um, I managed one year out of my 57 at Hopkins to be at Cornell, where I worked very closely with Kathy Foley and Dick Price and did my neurology with Jerry Posner. And the only thing I would say is Jerry taught me that the examination of the patient was where it has to begin. And I'll never forget a patient who had a spinal cord problem and Jerry came into the room and he saw that one of the intercostal muscles was atrophied. And he said, ah, the lesion, and with a gleam in his eye always, 
the lesion must be at T8. And Jerry, thank you for putting me in my career, not in neuro-oncology, but in the importance of the bedside. Thank you very much. This was terrific. Thank you. Uh, who is who else is going to speak? Yeah, he still has the raise the hand again. Yeah. Please. One small question for Professor Posner. I'm a bit intrigued. At what time did you go to sleep, actually? <laughs> Uh, I have a polymorphism on the, one of the clock genes, uh, periodic two. It leads to an autosomal dominant called advanced sleep trait. So given my own devices, I go to bed at seven o'clock and I get up about 2.30. And uh, I've, now that I'm retired, I obviously couldn't do that when I was at work, but I always went to work early. Thank you. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much, all of you. Uh, I think uh, this was a fascinating session, and but despite the yeah. fact that one knows many publications, many works from Professor Posner has met him personally, it it was a very enlightening session from so many people and so many perspectives, and so many enlightening ideas to be carried forward. Uh, Professor Posner, I thank you very much that you were able to stay with us today. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's been really right. a privilege to be with you. I thank you for your kind words. I'm very grateful. Thank you, Professor Posner. Yeah, Lisa, and Lisa would like to say something? I am. Um, yes, I just would like to thank everyone who joined us this morning to recognize Jerry's many accomplishments. Jerry, you should know the incredible enthusiasm. Um, that I received when approaching everyone here. They were all so excited and happy to be able to be a part of this. So on behalf of everyone, I wanna thank you, Jerry, for being with us. I wanna thank Drs. Meshram and Griswold for organizing this. And um, mostly, Jerry, at the end, I wanna thank you. Um, personally, you made a difference in, you know, you made my career actually, um, by creating so many opportunities as everyone has um, already alluded to and what you've done for them. So um, on behalf of everyone, we are really deeply grateful for um, the inspiration that you've afforded neurologists around the world for, a, for many, many years and for the personal um, interventions that you've made on behalf of so many trainees and faculty during your, your tenure at MSK and Cornell. Um, we're all deeply grateful and um, you deserve this recognition really more than anyone I could think of. Thank you all for your kind words. I'm most grateful. Yeah, Professor Postner, what is the message that you would like to give to young neurologists now? <laughs> I just think you have to follow your passions. Uh, I, I enjoyed every day that I went to work, even when things weren't going well. Uh, and I thought I made a contribution to the patients whom I cared for. And that was always very important for me. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Professor Postner and uh, for being with us uh, for this uh, session and it, uh, i think it, is a, it was a great tribute to a great person and all the faculty uh, who contributed lisa and all the contributors they in fact in their own way are inspiration person and uh, it was truly a great session and thank you uh, professor uh, Wilson, uh, for sharing the session and he's in italy and he could take the time out uh, from Italy to, you know, he had gone there to give a talk and he could uh, take away some time and connect, join with us for this important session uh, later in the night. He has, a, he has to fly back. And thank you, Professor Wilson, uh, for being with us. And I would like to thank everyone and uh, would like to remind that on uh, next, uh, next month, on 4th of June, uh, we have a session about Dr. David Z, another inspiration person, when we talk of high moment, 
with his uh, uh, Lianti uh, book about the uh, eye movement, as we talk about Schubert and Koma, the Plum and Postner. And uh, so next time it is going to be David Lee, and we'll be joined by Arthur Sheikh and Daniel Gold uh, with uh, Professor David Lee. On 2nd July, we have a very interesting session about uh, uh, Professor Cecil Wong. And uh, that is going to be another cracker of session. And on 22nd July, uh, we have World Brain Day. And uh, I think we should all celebrate this uh, day with you know, great enthusiasm. And the theme for this World Brain Day is uh, uh, brain health for all. So in India, we have decided to celebrate in a big way with more than 100 activities and uh, carry forward during the week. Uh, from 22nd July onward. So, uh, hope that, uh, that this uh, World Brain Day becomes a great success. And uh, this uh, inspiration series, I think, is uh, the, all the uh, sessions uh, are on the WFN website. Uh, and those who have missed today's session can later on watch this important session on the WFN website, eLearning Hub. And I would like to open the all the uh, uh, contributors and uh, other people who have joined, Steve, Judy Kazi, Sita, uh, Marco Medina, Professor J.M. Timothy, and uh, Professor David Lee, Sheikh, and uh, all those people who have contributed. Uh, I think it was a great tribute to a great person. Yeah. And it went uh, uh, beyond imagination. I have been trying to, you know, build do this session for quite some time. <laughs> for the last maybe four or five months, I was trying to get uh, in touch with uh, Professor Postner. And uh, I think thank you, Professor Gunsang, for helping me and uh, getting all these people. I, I think Lisa has put up a wonderful faculty uh, uh, to uh, give tribute to uh, Professor Postner. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks once again. Thank you. Just as the president of the World Federation, Meshram, thank you for doing this. And it really keeps us going into personalities and will stimulate us all. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.